Good evening and a warm welcome from SPICMAK team to everybody gathered here. And we hope we are all, and you all are, you are all keeping in good health. I'm Prashanti. I'm a volunteer of SPICMAK Europe, Germany chapter. And I look forward to inviting you all to today's program, Anubhav series. And this is the grand finale of the week long program. For those of you who are new to SPICMAK and its activities, it is our pleasure to welcome you to our family. SPICMA K stands for the Society for the Promotion of Indian Classical Music and Culture Amongst Youth. SPICMA K is a voluntary youth movement founded in 1977 by Dr. Kiran Seth, professor at IIT Delhi, who was awarded the Padma Shri for his contribution to the arts in 2009. SPICMA K makes education holistic by promoting the intangible aspects of Indian cultural heritage, by organizing programs in India, in Indian and world classical music, dance, folk, music, uh, yoga, meditation, crafts, and cinema classics inside education campuses. With respect to Anubhav, uh, we are almost at the end of the week-long Anubhav series 2021, where school children have witnessed workshops. They have come to interact with maestros, national awardees, and have taken back a rich cultural heritage with them over the last week. We hope you have made the best of our week-long Anubhav series, which was aimed at creating an ashram-like atmosphere at home for students and brought you a fresh air of fresh breath of air in the middle of these challenging times. Till now, you have witnessed graced maestros from different fields of classical music and dance. Today, under the Spick McKay's World Heritage Series, we present to you Maestro Stefan Baradieu. Stefan Baradieu is the third generation of violinists in a family with a long musical tradition. Baratyu has since his debut in 1981 been an active soloist, chamber musician, and orchestra leader, participating in numerous national and international festivals as he toured extensively in Norway, USA, Asia, South America, and Europe. His career also includes a long list of disc recordings. Since 1985, he has been the principal and artistic director of the Baratyu Institute of Music in Oslo, a music conservatory founded in 1927 by his grandparents. The institute, under his leadership, has become one of the leading educational institutions within the field of music in Norway. Bratu is today considered one of the leading violin professors in Scandinavia. From 1990 to 1996, Bratu held position as artistic director of the Christian Sun Chamber Orchestra. From 1998, he has been artistic director of the Chamber Orchestra Oslo Camerata. Paradio's collaboration and duo performances with viola player Sun Mi Chung is well known for their contribution to Norwegian music and their joint pedagogical efforts, which brought them numerous awards. Amongst them are the prestigious Oslo City Culture Award, and the Norwegian Arts Council Honorary Award. Parat Yu is playing on a violin built by J.B. Guadigini in 1751, made available to him by the foundation Dextra Musica. In 2002, H.M. King Harald of Norway appointed Stefan Parat Yu to Knight of the First Class of the Royal Order of St. Olav. He's also the Knight First Class of the Order of Lion in Finland. We are very happy to have received a welcome address uh, from the French ambassador of India, Emmanuel Lenoir, on this uh, very grand occasion. We would like you, sir, to share a few thoughts with us. Good evening. It's a great delight for me to be with you tonight for this uh, concert. And uh, it's a note to uh, music and to uh, it's a great uh, show by a uh, renowned violinist, uh, Stéphane Bardieu. And it's really good that uh, after all these uh, months of uh, lockdown, which has affected uh, all of us and uh, uh, restricted our access to uh, culture, to uh, show, to concert, that we can really gather again together. So thank you again. Thank you very much. I hope that we can do uh, even more of this, that in the coming months, as COVID recedes, we can uh, resume uh, normal, I would say, cultural life, because it's uh, an essential part of uh, life of, for all of us. Yeah, you may have seen in France uh, for uh, two weeks now, uh, museums have reopened, concert halls have reopened, 
uh, theaters have reopened and it really makes a big change in the life of the French people because we really need that. We need to communicate, we need to share, we need to feel together. And uh, I wish to read that for India and I wish that we can very soon resume our normal cultural life. Well, thank you very much and I'm going to enjoy the concert now with you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your kind words. Today's program will consist of three classics from the world of Western classical music. The first piece will be a composition by Fritz Kreisler. Fritz Kreisler was an immensely popular Austrian violinist in the first half of the last century. At age seven, Kreisler entered the Vienna Conservatory and from 1885 to 1887, he studied composition and violin at the Paris Conservatory. After a, after a successful concert tour of the United States, he returned to Vienna to study medicine. He was a very good composer and left numerous and short characteristic pieces. One of them is Liebeslied, which stands for Love's Sorrow, is what will be performed on the recording, which we will see in a few minutes from now. The second piece that will be played today is by the most famous Italian composer, Antonio Vivaldi. Antonio Vivaldi is the most famous Baroque composer known. His Four Seasons has become one of the most celebrated and most performed compositions in the world. This piece depicts the four seasons in Vivaldi's own musical interpretations. The chirping birds of the spring, the hot lull of the summer, the joyful harvest season of autumn, and the shivering cold of icy winter. Each of these short concerts consists of three movements, two fast ones separated by a contrast to a slow one. In this recording, you will hear young talented vinyl, violinists, students of Bharat U himself, aged 13 to 16, who have great international careers today. The third piece is one of the most, um, is composed by one of the most recognized Norwegian composers, Edward Grieg. As a teenager, Edward was sent to the, uh, sent to the best music conservatory in Europe in Leipzig in Germany. After he graduated, Grieg spent some time in Copenhagen in Denmark. Apart from his famous concerto, the Holberg Suite is the most performed co uh, composition internationally. Grieg wrote this piece in 1884 in memory of the Norwegian Danish playwright Ludwig Holberg, born in 1684. In this piece, Grieg uses the old Baroque suite form, but in the romantic and typical national color, so characteristically all in his music. Tonight, we will bring to you these three pieces followed one after the other. We hope you can sit back and enjoy the concerts and uh, please stay tuned after the concert. Maestro Stefan Baratiu will join us shortly for, a, for an international session with us.
I hope you all went through the same emotional roller coaster watching those pieces together as much as I did. Um, I would like, uh, I see on the call, Stefan Parat has joined us. Um, I would like Rashmi Ma'am to please introduce, uh, to invite the dignitaries on the call. Thank you, Prashanti. That was an absolutely captivating concert. All three pieces were mesmerizing and spellbounding. Thank you, Your Excellency Monsieur Emmanuel Lenay, the Ambassador of France to India, for your kind wishes and enjoying the concert with us. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us the maestro himself, Stefan Baradiu. Thank you very much, Stefan, for making time to be part of our online convention, Anubhav 2021. We are absolutely honored by your presence amongst us today. We're also lucky to have with us a long-time partner, colleague, and friend, Mr. Halger Friedland, 
of Kultur Tankun, who has been very instrumental in making the collaboration between Spikmuki and Rikskinsertini of Norway a grand success. We welcome you, Halger, and Sher Thorby, if you're still here. Along with our Norwegian friends, we also have amongst us our own Mr. Sunit Tandon, considered to be a great uh, authority on Western classical music. I welcome all of you to our concert today. I will now request uh, our very, very dedicated and talented co-volunteer Prashanti to take the evening further and bring open the floor to all. Thank you, ma'am. And welcome, Stefan. I welcome all the dignitaries to the call. I would just like to introduce um, a little bit about Stefan Baratiu's institute before we go further. So since 1985, Stefan Baratiu has been the principal and artistic director of the Barat Institute of Music in Oslo, a music conservatory founded in 1927 by his grandparents, pianist Mary Baratiu and the violinist Henrik Tiu, and has played, cent played a central role in the music education in Norway. Drawing on a more continental frame of reference than usual found in Norway, children, young people and adults, students are taught under the same roof inspired by the founder's motto from music kindergarten to the concert podium. Professor Barat Dew has himself been a teacher and his students today are to be found amongst the foremost violinists in Norway, including concert masters and soloists. Barat Dew, today is considered one of the leading violin professors in Scandinavia. Orchestra and ensembles currently prepare and execute challenging music programs, which result in about 200 concert productions a year. Through these activities, Barat Dew offers one of the most unique and inspiring environments to learn music in Norway. We welcome you, sir, um, Stefan Barat Dew, to our program, and we look forward to the interaction session with you. Would you like to say a few words before we go into the question and answer session? which follows this? Well, I must say, I must thank you all for uh, inviting me to take part in this wonderful uh, conference. And um, your, the, the wonderful purpose of, the, of your uh, organization to, to bring out classical music, of course, Indian classical music, but also high level Western classical music. And that you have chosen me to to uh, to be a guest in, in this uh, conference is is a, I take as a great honor, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, the music that uh, we could uh, uh, offer today is is a mix of uh, prof highly professional musicians in in collaboration with uh, great aspiring talents, and um, I thought the, that program would probably. Uh, hit the audience that we had today. So thank you very much for inviting me. I had really looked forward to this opportunity. And um, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's great for Norway also to have such a good relations to, to India and vice versa. So we have for many years had collaborations and uh, also Kamrata was back on a tour in India with Subramaniam uh, some, quite some years ago, but that was also a memorable tour we had. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I hope you had a great time during your visit with Spikmake to India back in the years. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, prepared by the volunteers of uh, Spikmake Europe and India. I would like to go with the first one. So um, if you look at your institute, it wishes to create an environment that demands intense work from every individual involved right early from uh, the childhood, right uh, until adulthood. And this requires a great deal of self-discipline uh, since most of the work that has to be undertaken alone and the practice that one needs to go, uh, one needs to do uh, is immense. And this is very similar to what we uh, see in the Guru Shishya Parampara as we call it in India the guru being the teacher and the shishya being the pupil and the lineage that we would like to take forward. Um, this, is, uh, this is a parallel that we see with India. Uh, we would like to know in today's fast paced world, what values do you think today's children need to derive from your experiences from setting up this institution? I think it's, um, it's, it's many angles into that, but I, I think First of all, of course, to become an excellent performer as in Indian music or in, in Western music, you have to, you need an early start and you need 
uh, highly professional, highly dedicated teachers from a young age. And you need to create as a school, my, our purpose or vision is to create the best possible uh, environment to the young talents when they need it. You know, it, it will be different levels of education. Uh, when you are very small, you need cert certain things, but you get older and you get more uh, advanced. You need to have people around you that probably has uh, achieved something more. You need to be in contact with excellence. You need a master. You, and the master doesn't need to be the absolute uh, highest level of, of classical music. It must be someone that uh, a young person will look up to. Uh, and you have to be in that environment. And also you have to make music. Certain things in music you cannot teach. You have to experience it. You have to be a part of a group. And um, that's what we quite try to create. And we see it uh, again and again that when young musicians experience that, they, 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 something happens in their minds. Something happens in the con concept and the conception of or where the quality lies, where the possibilities are. And this is extremely, um, uh, what do you say, I inspiring at that time. So what we are trying to do, and that's why we have, as the only music education um, institution in Norway, we have kept this old conservatory vision that music does not know the borders of age. You cannot group it into that music has different ways to, to move and it needs to interact. So these last, uh, I, I, I would say last uh, 30 years, we have tried more and more to integrate the professional society and make also the professional highest level musicians to have, feel a responsibility for the generation to come. So um, I think that's the, that's, that's, that's one, maybe the most sort of musical uh, important aspect. But as for the individual, it's also the, the benefits you have from actually learning something, to achieve something, to reach your goal. And with music, it's so many, many aspects of, of, of a human being taking part in developing yourself as a musician. So I think the 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 the... I, I must say, I, I, when I look at the young kids today, I, I feel so envious. <laughs> I wish I had that possibility when I was young. But the, the po possibility to really focus on something that you love, to meet someone else that actually do the same thing and loves it as much. Because mu young musicians tend to be very much left alone in their practice room uh, they have to practice three or four hours a day, daily basis, and they will stay alone. So if they can meet with others doing the same, the same having the same passion, that's very, very uh, rewarding for them. And I, I think on a human side, you develop certain, certain um, skills of communication that, that is rare within the field of art and of course within the field of music. You need to be flexible, you need to understand others, you to re need to respect others um, and so forth. So I think it's a holistic um, approach, but still with, the, with a, an aim to, to give the, the best growing environment for every one individual. Thank you, sir. I think the, your involvement with us today is already one side of showing us how to look, uh, to listen and learn. So thank you for that. Um, our next question is by a volunteer, Ravi, who's located in the Netherlands. Ravi, would you like to go? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Prashanti. And uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Dr. Barrett. Um, I'm a student at TU Delft, the Netherlands, and uh, I have a question. Um, regarding, say, uh, the uh, the similarities between, uh, say, Western and uh, Indian uh, classical uh, uh, instruments. So, um, what do you think are some of the important tools that Western soloists use that are also used by Indian instrumentalists? Um, and uh, it would be interesting to know if you have found any parallels with methods of Indian ornamentation, say, for example, uh, the closely spaced uh, strings in, uh, in, in a gamak or the sliding note in the mind. Um, 
So, uh, what cultures have inspired you to paint this musical interpretation? Well, that's a good question. I'm afraid I cannot answer uh, uh, very precisely of what, let's say, ornamentation. Ornamentation in uh, Western music has has many uh, schools or many different uh, cultures, uh, cultural, historical uh, um, sources. And so uh, the Indian, as I understand, the Indian classical music has uh, a set of, of incredible, uh, what should you say, um, ornamentations that has a sort of deeper meaning in, in the music and its skills that take years to actually to, uh, to master. Uh, as to the playing, oh, um, I, I think it's a lot of similarities because, as I said earlier, the, we need to start to be able physically to be able to play the violin. Uh, you have to start at an early age. You have to train that because at a certain uh, point, it's too late. You cannot become a good violinist if you start, let's say, at 15 years of age. It's, it's in, physically impossible. And the challenges and the, the precision, I think, is uh, we have a lot in common uh, from, uh, from all all, I mean, all professional uh, music making and instrumentalists in, in all uh, cultures will find common grounds on certain, uh, certain technical things, certain physical things. But also, I think, in the expression, even you have different languages, it's something human uh, that is common. I think that the, the, the need uh, to communicate one's uh, sentiment, one's, one's uh, it's, I mean, music is communication in the, in a very high, highly uh, shape, you know, you have, you want to communicate from one person to another. In a concert, I always feel that one speaks about bad or good audience. I don't think it's any bad audience. I think, I think that it's a matter of communication and the communication starts with the performer. The performer needs to really believe in what he does and then he will convey and he will reach out for, to communicate that music. Um, I have many examples. So I think for me, some of the most wonderful performers, when I listen to them, it's, it all seems so easy. It's so it, it's the, the, they're, they're, their uh, story is so easy to understand. Their phrasing is so easy to 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 follow, um, and and I think that is um, I think this is what everyone feels in all all kind of different kind of music. But the common feeling of the you you human need to communicate the expression that I think is is uh, similar to all to for instance Indian and Western music. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a question from a volunteer who couldn't join us directly, but we have one of our youngest volunteers, Mahika, from UK, London. She's nine years old and she has done her grade three in violin. And she wants to know how you prepare for a concert. What do you do exactly before the performance? Yes. <laughs> well, that's, that's a very good question. But um, for me, it's important to have. Um, peace of mind. I think it's, uh, I, I try not to be uh, in a, put myself in a stressful situation, but have a kind of, not meditation, but that to, to collect oneself and, uh, and, and, and try to feel the, the weight in the body to, to feel that you, you, you are in, in, in a comfortable state of mind. That, that is for me very important. And also to, to go through what I actually want with that music. What is the room that I want to create? What is, uh, and go on stage and, uh, and go for that. Um, but, you know, all people feel kind of some kind of uh, uncomfortable <laughs> kind of, of nervousness when you, you enter a stage uh, one way or the other. And this can, 
you know, be so different from concert to concert and you never know when it hits you uh, badly. But I had many experiences on both the wonderful feeling and, and some the dreadful uh, fear of going on stage and play for someone. But I think, I think the main thing is not to have too much uh, focus inward to yourself, but have the focus that this is music you want out. And remember that everyone sitting in this audience, they want to experience something nice. They, they are friendly to you. Otherwise, they wouldn't buy the ticket. So it's, it's, no, it's nothing to really fear. They are open-minded. And, um, and as I said, you start communicating. So remember that you're playing to an audience and not someone uh, judging you for whatever you think they may judge you for. I mean, I think that's a very important um, statement that you made to stay calm when you're nervous. So I think that's very uh, difficult for most performers. So I think valuable words from your side. Thank you for that. Um, Pratyush uh, would like to ask a question. Pratyush, would you like to go next? Yeah, greetings. Okay. I'm Pratyush Kumar, uh, volunteer for the TU Delft Netherlands chapter. And my question is about improvisation. So coming from an Indian classical music background where the compositions are heavily dependent on the interpretation of the artist and the, uh, the impressions that the artist leaves on the composition versus Western classical music, where the composition is written down to the very last detail. So what is your definition of the scope of improvisation, maybe keeping these three pieces we just heard in mind? And how do you encourage your students to improvise outside of the notations? I, I can answer the, the last uh, question first, because improvisation has become more and more uh, actual and more and more uh, got more and more interest in uh, Western classical uh, environments. And, and we do that a lot in my school. Unfortunately, myself, I, I was not raised with that. Uh, and I think that's um, I think this is coming back. Uh, and uh, many of the kids in, uh, in our school, uh, they are very able to, to uh, improvise, but they also, of course, improvise in, in, their, uh, in, the, in the classical sort of tonality. Uh, I think that the future will actually give more and more of that um, freedom to young musicians. I think it will be in demand in the music world that how it develops. Uh, so that's one, one part of it. I think this, this is important question. You also, also can say, at least in our school, and I know many other places, uh, improvisation has become uh, more and more important. I can tell you that the menuin competition, we had menuin competition here in 2010, and we insisted that all the students, all the participants, uh, they had to do an improvisation. And, the, you know, it was a big fuss all over the world. The teacher said, how can I do that? Because I don't improvise. No, that you don't improvise, but introduce your student to learn something. And this has been staying on. And um, so that was a kind of provocation at that time uh, to a very internationally renowned competition. So this is coming. Uh, but improvisation is also a matter of frame, I think. You have a frame and you have to know that frame. And when you know the frame, like let's say a, a composer like Beethoven, he's very strict. And I always teach and I also live in that uh, uh, conviction that one has to learn Beethoven very, very, to, to interpret Beethoven, you have to try to understand why does he like the Boeings? Why does he write the, everything? And, and then just try to do that very, very exact. When I do that, then suddenly it opens a room for improvisation. Because then you have, you have got what, what is the intention of Beethoven in this sonata, for instance. When you have got that, you have to try that first. Then you get a huge room for improvisation. But the frame is quite, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's limited, but it's, uh, and that's where you see the greatest artists doing something with the classical composers fantastic things it's and that's the freedom what do you what do you why do you say uh Marta Argerich or you know some great uh, uh contemporary musician 
place of fantastic. You do it because of the interpretation, the freedom that they take, the, the limits that they stretch without ruining the concept and the frame of the music. Because if you start improvising on, on Beethoven, if you haven't done this before, Beethoven just disappears and it doesn't, it doesn't really work. So improvisation, I think, has, um, has got more and more in different areas, you understand, uh, focus also here in, uh, in, in the Western uh, community. Thank you, sir. Um, Paritesh from London has the next question. Uh, greetings to you all. Uh, this is Paritesh Royal from UK chapter. And so my question is that, how do you perceive that in this modern European world, the cl Western classical music can, you know, uh, flourish? And secondly, uh, how do you see the, you know, young Europeans getting into the, uh, you know, uh, this Western classical music outside the musical schools? And thirdly, if any suggestions for the Indian students or Indians to learn Western classical music and, you know, get some type of fusion, uh, you know, built upon Indian and Western classical music to perform upon. Thank you, sir. Well, I, can you repeat uh, exactly the first question you had? Yes, sir. Uh, how do you see uh, that the influence of Western classical music has been there in the modern European era? Yeah, I, I, I think that Western classical music has a lot of challenges today. That's for sure. Uh, I think uh, it's very conservative in a way, and you are kept sort of a culture in a conservatory, conservative way. The concerts, everyone struggles with this. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, what you say uh, development will happen, innovation in this area. But I think that one of the reasons. I think, first of all, I think the classical music has some great uh, values for many people. And of course, they're raised in a society that, after all, I mean, it, it, it's part of their culture, many places at least. And today with the digital um, world that we live in, it's very accessible. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that it keeps uh, alive. And I think that, the music is so good that it will not die. That's that's for sure. But it's it's the way that it is uh, presented. I think we'll we are seeing a lot of new and um, inventive ways to communicate that music. The new platforms, new uh, arenas where you, where you use it. And I, and I think for um, for India and classical mu music, I've been a couple of times in India, and I know a little bit. Um, how it how how it is? I think the classical Western music is not that strong, of course, in in India. But uh, I think it should be a possible for people to to learn um, classical uh, music. I mean, Western music also in India. Uh, but it might be be difficult to to find a, a, a place or find a way to really actually develop uh, the, the, what you call the, the very best. You understand what I mean? Yeah, what you need in, because it's, as with the Indian music, I, I think that would be difficult if you were in Norway you know, to, to really become a master. It's difficult. You need to be where you can get the right influence at the right time. So I, I don't have a very good answer to that, but I think that Many things happens. I think with the pandemic situation we are in, with the environment uh, challenges, the international music life is going to find new ways. I think traveling is a bit over. In, in I mean, in the large scale, I remember the old days. People could play in New York and London the same evening with a Concorde airplane. That kind of things. It's it's not uh, happening. I think I think people will. You know, it's a change to a greener environment. And I know a lot of uh, even uh, orchestras I heard just now in Sweden, 
they have a green policy, so they, they don't want the soloists to come by plane. They want to come with train. And all this will also change probably for the better. I think that one gets more peace to actually do things on a longer term, not just from here to here to here to here. And, uh, and that will, again, uh, lead to more um, innovative and more collaboration within the music uh, society, you know, the music profession, uh, you know, more, more collaboration between the different music arts, uh, like for instance, concerts that we did with the uh, Subramanian was with classical music and Indian music and his group and, and with him. And I think that's experience that actually speaks to an audience. And I think maybe we will see more of that kind of uh, concerts and that, kind of programming or concerts in the future. Most that? I think the very fact that we are sitting here today and able to talk to you is also a big honor and something that the pandemic has uh, enabled for us. So thank you for that. Uh, we have one last question before Rashmi ma'am adds a few words. Uh, we have Shraddha Gupta next. Hello, uh, greetings to everyone. Thanks for Shanti for giving me this opportunity. So I have a question regarding um, what specific tools of establishment do you use to bring out emotion or paint a picture for the pieces of different time, different eras, years? For example, uh, today we uh, have heard three different time periods. And is it an easy to punctuate the rhythm of peace uh, for example, in Bach or Vivaldi composition from the Baroque era versus uh, Kaiserless comp uh, compositions of the modern era? What do you think? Well, that's a very good question because we have uh, historically about 300 years to deal with in classical music. And we had a long, or still have, but we have had uh, last 40 years uh, it, it tends to see more and more specialized musicians. They specialize in Baroque or they specialize in the, in the classical period. Or you, one is trying to find the source of all the, uh, of the where, how was the music played at the time of the composer. That's, that's one part of it. Uh, but it still belongs to the same tradition. I think a big change came in the... Uh, um, you know, like 1940, 50s, 60s, uh, where it it changed sort of a path. I think contemporary uh, composers today they use the much more of um, they are not sort of uh, the tonal system has you know it it's been exploding uh, hundred years ago, and then they find other ways to express and other ways to to compose. For a performer, that might be very difficult. But I think that, um, first of all, I don't think it is a right or wrong way to interpret something. But it is a, it's a serious or not serious, <laughs> if one could say that. I think that if you are serious, as I, uh, I say, as I said earlier, that you really dig into the music and try to understand what the composer actually wants, then you're actually quite free to play it your way. It will be right. It's, it's not sort of a set of rules that this is where you have to play this or this, have to play that. But it, it, it's quite demanding to be, I think, the uh, performer of tomorrow. You need to know, you have to have much more knowledge and just be good at playing your violin. That is over. One has to be very good player because it's very high competition. But you need all the other things on top of that. And, and that is the understanding, that's improvisation, that is to actually be able to be so flexible that you can take part in a, a jazz gig or understand that if an Indian uh, you know, uh, group comes and they ask you to, to do something and then not expect that, us then to play like a professional Indian musician, but, but to take part, have an understanding of other other cultures, other you know, musical expression, and and actually be able to take take part in it, on their in their way. You understand what I mean? Uh, so I I am quite positive to the future. <laughs> See, 
I hope. Uh, but it's a good question because it's it's a challenge to to um, also understand that you cannot play, uh, let's say, baroque music as you play a romantic piece. It's too it's too di- you have to understand the aesthetic. You know, like in the in the baroque music, it's much closer to the folk music. Actually, it comes t- uh, a lot of the baroque music. It comes from from dances that was actually played on the local pub, but the composer, you know, uh, played played with it and 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 turned it over to to a concert classical piece, and and today, so we have to understand that we can. So while while the romantic, highly romantic music had different aesthetic uh, visions and uh, and uh, environments, so that one has to of course, uh, uh, deal with. And that comes to knowledge. A larger scope on, 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 uh, of knowledge, not just the specific instrumental musics, uh, but, but, but the whole, you know, the history. Understand our own background, in a way. And also our own time, I think, with contemporary music. For me, I think it's either quite some contemporary music, and I always find it, very uh, very interesting and, uh, and 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 challenging yes but also very rewarding because when i work with a composer and write a piece that never has been played and i will be the first for instance then my creative uh, work has to start immediately from day 1 whereas with beethoven as i told you i have to really go into to get that frame just right and you know find before I get the freedom. But with a with a with a contemporary music, you have to start that creative process uh, immediately. So I, I find that very interesting. Thank you, sir. I think um, we are done with the question and answer session, and I think the answers that we got were quite uh, insightful for us. Um, I would like to now hand over to Rashmi, ma'am, to take us back a few years with the, about the experiences we've had with the Norwegian team that we are hosting today. Thank you, Stefan, for a very enriching and enlightening session for many, many young, aspiring musicians who are watching us today. And it actually is reminding me of about 12 years ago when Dr. Said, the founder of Spik McKay, and I visited your institute. We picked up your two very, very talented uh, uh, disciples, Hemsing sisters. And yes, uh, they, yes they came to India, <laughs> they toured. And now they are, of course, going all over the world. Uh, now we are, this was like with um, Rick Skinsertene, and now we're trying to uh, work with um, uh, Kultur Tankan to bring in Catherine Chen, and maybe we'll take your support in uh, trying to bring more musicians to India. It was a 15 year long uh, collaboration, which is on hold because of the COVID. So um, yes. you, you have to help us with getting some great musicians to India. Of course, I will. Whatever I can do, Rashmi, and, and thank you for thinking of me. And I remember very well your visit. And, and you know, the Hemsing girls, they were part, you, you recognized her playing the yes. Vivaldi uh, spring. Yes, I did. And yes, also the Elbrey, they were both in the in the Greek in the orchestra, and they're doing both very great. As a matter yes. of fact, I'm in their home home place now in middle of Norway, uh, giving a course. How nice! So please give them our love and tell them that we remember them all the time. Dr. Kiran Seth has always been, uh, you know, remembering them. That that was a beautiful tour we had. Young girls and they played beautifully. But just before we let you go, we have a very, very great um, friend of our movement here, uh, Mr. Sunit Tandon. He is the president of Delhi Music Society, and uh, he is uh, an authority on uh, Western classical music. I just want him to say a few words to you, and then we let you go, and Prashanti will give you the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rashmi. I must say, Maestro, that was a wonderful recording from some time ago that you presented for us with uh, your ensemble as well as your pupils. 
and it's such a pleasure to see them in their young stages and now they many of them have become major musicians all over the world i know for instance i have heard many recordings of uh, will de frank playing um, in various concert halls and uh, uh, premises so it was really wonderful and i really enjoyed your interpretations they were so, so full of life so athletic and vigorous and and, and precise um, I, I enjoyed the interpretations of these pieces, which we know so well, the Chrysler, as well as the uh, Vivaldi Four Seasons, as well as uh, the Holberg Suite. They were absolutely delightful presentations. I really must thank you, Maestro, for a wonderful, wonderful session and for your wonderful answers. We had some terrific questions from our young volunteers and musicians, and you gave them such insightful and detailed and patient answers. I'm sure everybody has benefited greatly from this session. I certainly enjoyed this session immensely. Thank you so much, my son. Thank you. So wonderful. That, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm getting embarrassed to hear all these wonderful words from, from a maestro like yourself. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that really very much. Thank you so much. On that note, thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, before we wrap up the evening, I would like to really once again convey our sincere gratitude to Maestro Stefan Baratiu for being here and gracing the Anubhav series with this uh, mesmerizing session that we had just now. Just to conclude, uh, Anubhav would not have been possible if it was not for the support from the Department of uh, Youth Affairs, Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Ministry of Textiles, Ministry of Culture, SRF Foundation, Ashok Leyland, Takshashila Education Society, Dr. Vikram Seth, and Kusumkar. We thank all the volunteers of Speak Maki for organizing this, both on screen and behind the screen. Please watch out for uh, our further activities on our website, speakmaki.org, all our social media sites on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And please do uh, sign up to volunteer with us if you think what we did right now was uh, super interesting for you. Namaste and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.